And now, coming to you from the Pensado Media Center, powered by Westlake Pro. We've got an all ITL show this week, a sneak peek at a brand new mix contest coming up, and Gear Expo was all that and a bag of fried pickles. You're at the place, it's Pensado's place. Hi everyone, trust that your weekend audio was really good. Ours was. Today I'm holding down the desk while Dave is down at Blackbird teaching for the week. A shout out to our partners, the Blackbird Academy, Vintage King, DTS, Avid, Fab Factory, Lander, and of course, Recording Connection. Hey, before we get to this week's show, have we got a treat for you. Next week, we kick off a brand new mix contest with Indaba and Converse Rubber Tracks. Remember last one? You guys absolutely kicked butt. Well, this one is going to even be better. Features a super cool band called Jesus on the Main Line. You will meet them next week on the show. And of course, get a chance to enter, show off your skills, win some serious prizes, and much, much more. All the details on next week's show. Let's see your chops. Get ready to enter. Now, whew, just got back last night. We taped the show on Tuesday. Uh, Gear Expo was just a gas. Great panelists, great gear, gave some great gear away. There are audio lovers of every type, stripe. They're partying and learning and winning gear and meeting their heroes. And all our heroes took time to help them. Uh, we are busy editing this show down and we'll bring that to you next week, probably in a two part series. It was absolutely a ball. Nashville, we love you. A great, great time. Um, let's. Let's just pop down to Nashville real quick and have Dave say hello. Dave, what are you doing? Say hello from Blackbird Studios. Hey guys, Dave here down in Nashville, hanging with my buddies here at the Blackbird Sessions at the famous Blackbird Studios. I'm not at the place. <laughs> I'm at McBride's place. <laughs> Caught you guys off guard. Hey, for sure. Uh, I picked out uh, some uh, some videos from the group. To through three vaults that uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy. And uh, we've got an all ITL show for you this week. I can't wait to see you guys next week. We'll get back to the regular schedule. Uh, let's, let's show them how we say goodbye in the South. Let's throw in a y'all. Goodbye, y'all. So with Dave down at Blackbird Teaching, we just got in last night. We got a bunch of editing to do with this really cool Gear Expo footage. So Dave decided to handpick some of his favorite ITLs out of the Groove 3 catalog. We would just give you, let you smorgasbord out on them. Um, these are hand-picked stuff that'll help you learn and do your thing from our friends at Groove 3. We'll get all that done, get ready for next week, and we'll see you next week. Enjoy. Hi everybody, in this video I'm going to show you how you can help your kick poke out a little bit more. And it doesn't have to be just your kick, it can be anything. And we are going to play with what's called the transient. Now for those of you who don't know, the transient is the first little bit at the start of any sound. And it is pretty much all your brain needs to figure out how loud a sound is going to be. Uh, that initial transient uh, tells your brain a whole lot of information about the sound in a very short amount of time. So in order to kind of trick your brain into thinking a sound is going to be louder than it is or is more apparent than it actually is, all you really need to do is muck with this first little bit of the sound and you can leave the rest alone. So I've got a very busy track here, and if we take a listen to it, listen to the kick drum and how it's kind of in the back a little bit. Okay, so it's kind of got, wow, it's quite the, uh, quite the tail I've got there. So the kick is there, it's got enough kind of low end in it for now, but it's not as present as I'd like it to be. So I'm gonna show you a few ways that you can go about doing this. Now, my kick is just a single sample. This is also gonna work if you lay out your kicks uh, as audio files, but it is so much easier. 
even even just to do this, load it into a sampler because it's gonna make your life so much easier. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click on here and I'm gonna group this, not to drum rack, just a normal group, okay? I'm gonna open up this area here and what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna create a new uh, sample. So now I'm going to take, I've got a couple folders here in my uh, favorites places area. So I've got this closed hi-hat folder, which is er, full of closed hi-hats. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag one just in here. Now, if I solo the kick drum, what's gonna happen is exactly what you think. Okay, so I'm gonna mute this hi-hat. And if we look here, you can see that my kick, there's not a whole lot in the top end, okay? And what I want is I want it to be able to poke out a little more in the track, which means I'm probably gonna have to add some top end content to it. So like I said earlier, I'm happy with the lows, but in order to get it to poke out with all those synths and everything else going on, it's gonna need a bit more top end content, which is where this hi-hat comes in. Now this hi-hat by itself is a very short sample but it's still not short enough because you can tell it's a hi-hat. Now, you can go like this and shorten it up and get it to go like that. However, if you click this button here, which gives you a hot swap mode for the sample and you go uh, move down a couple and press your enter return button, you'll see now that it's reset the end loop brace, which is not what I want. So if you wanna flick through a dozen or 20 or 5,000 of your collected hi-hat samples, you don't wanna to have to keep mucking with this point here. So what you do is you adjust it by this length parameter here. And that will stay regardless of what sample you've got. So now if I play this and I go into hot swap mode again and press my up arrow and then enter, you'll notice now that I'm just getting the initial transient, okay? And of course I can adjust it to taste, get a little more length in there. You, because you're doing this, because you want it to poke out of your mix more, you don't want to do what I'm doing <laughs> right now. You wanna be doing this in your mix, right? Because that's how you're gonna hear it. And that's the, uh, the effect you want is gonna be in your mix. So always, 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 have this playing while you're searching for a new transient to stick on the end, which is in essence what I've done. So now instead of just this little up down blip there, we've got up down blip combined with with this thing, okay? Cause this is a very, very short amount of time here. But if we listen to it in the mix, and this is way too loud, but it'll just give you an idea of how much more it pokes out. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna do now in the background is I'm gonna flick through a, I'm gonna flick through a few samples and uh, see if one just kind of magically pops out at me. All right, so let's loop this up. All right, let's do 28. So what I don't want is one of those really, really piercing hats, which is way up here because that's gonna, that's just annoying. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stick with this 28 because it's kind of got like this low high frequency range. If we look at it on the frequency spectrum here. See, it's got a lot of low content in itself, but it's got this little blip up there, which is nice. So I'm gonna, actually what I might do just because I'm gonna high pass that because I just noticed there is some really low stuff in there. Not anymore. So what I just did is I just turned the filter on the sampler and uh, I've set it to like 1K. So what we're doing is we're getting rid of everything in 1K. I've high passed it at a 24 dB slope. So now, Now it's just a matter of adjusting the volume to taste so it doesn't sound like you've literally just overlaid a hi-hat on top of your kick. Okay, so now my kick is 
well, it appears to be poking out a lot more, but I haven't adjusted uh, any of the low end. And that's an issue with a lot of uh, younger or inexperienced producers is that they want the kick louder. Well, I'll just uh, boost the low end up. No, don't, because all you're going to do is you're going to muddy up your mix. Instead, do the, the yin of the yang. And instead of boosting up here, boost up in the top end, and you can actually get a better result. So without it, Okay, so I'm looking at like minus, minus 13 dB is enough uh, for me right now. And now you don't have to just use hi-hats. You can use, well, pretty much anything. Uh, another thing you can do is you can actually take another kick drum and drop it in there and just use the transient of those kick drums. So that way, people who have expertly crafted these kick drums um, have put a lot of work into some of these and you can take advantage of that by stealing their transients. So if we just listen to this one, right? Doesn't sound like a whole lot. Actually, you know what it sounds like. It sounds like they layered a hi-hat over top of their initial transient. So what we can do then is now we can take transients from other kick drums and just add them on top of ours. And if you really want to get tricky, you can do something like this and you can get rid of your transient altogether and completely swap it with another one from somebody else's kick drum. Uh, you may want to do this in audio though. Once you find two that are very similar, you can take it in and uh, do it in audio in the session view because that way you can line up zero crossings and whatnot and get a bit more precise. But for here, this is a really, really fast and easy way of auditioning hundreds of different samples and seeing which ones jive with yours. So I'm gonna put my transient back here. And just for the heck of it, I'm gonna flick through a couple kick drums and we'll see if any of them uh, strike our fancy. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take off that filter as well because I may like some of the low end that comes through the transient on these kick drums. So let's just do a few auditions in the mix. Okay, so this one, this one doesn't add as much top end, but it definitely has a little extra spike in it that we didn't have before. Okay, so it helps our kick drum poke in a lot more. Anyways, you can use this technique on all sorts of things, toms or drums or snares or whatever, the transient swapping technique. I hope that's helped a lot of you and I'll see you in the next video. In this video, we're gonna take a look at the workflow enhancements for fades. They're simple keyboard shortcuts, but they sure are handy. Let's pull up the fade dialog. I'll create a crossfade here, and I'll use Command F on Mac or Control F on Windows. The fade dialog window appears. And what I can do is just use my mouse to make selections. However, there are some shortcuts for changing our fade in and fade out curve. If I press my Option key on Mac, or the Alt key on Windows, I can use the arrow keys on my keyboard to change some of the attributes of the crossfade in. While holding Option or Alt, I can press the left right arrows to change the curve. I can push the up down arrows to change the shape from standard S curve or the fade shape menu. Now to change the fade out shape, I could hold Command on Mac or Control on Windows, and that'll change the out curve. And up and down will change the output shape from standard S curve or preset. Now we can use similar keyboard shortcuts for batch fades. So I'm gonna highlight across three clips and bring up the batch fade dialog. I can hold Option on Mac or Alt on Windows and then use those arrow keys to change the fade in shape. And I can use up and down to change the shape from standard to S-curve to preset. 
Now to change the fade out shape in batch fades, I'll hold shift option on Mac or shift alt on Windows, and I'll use the same left right arrows to change the fade out shape. And I can also change the shape from standard S curve or preset. It's a small thing, but if you're working with fades a lot, it really saves the time of having to mouse around with those keyboard shortcuts. Another new handy shortcut is the option to fade in or fade out from a point. So typically you would fade in or fade out by clicking and dragging to highlight an area and then Command F or Control F brings up the fade dialog. You click OK and there's your fade out. What we can now do is just place our cursor with the I-beam tool at a certain point. On Mac I can press the Control key and press the letter D to fade to the beginning, creating a fade in up to that point. Or I can hold the Control key on Mac and press the letter G to fade from that point to the end. If you're a Windows user, the command is the same. Just use the Windows key or Start key, Windows D to fade to start, Windows G to fade to end. So it saves you the time of highlighting a specific area to fade in and out. Just click, insert the point, and create your fade in or fade out. Again, these seem awfully simple, but they can be really handy, especially if you're working with a lot of fades and you need to work fast. Thanks for watching. I want to talk very briefly about third-party plugins. So far in this tutorial series, we've been using just the stock compressor that comes with Studio One. And I did that on purpose because I wanted to show you that it really doesn't matter what compressor you're using. It doesn't really matter what DAW you're using. The principles are going to apply no matter what DAW you use and no matter what compressors you choose to use. So I want to make that clear. Now, once you understand the concepts, then you can certainly start using some of your favorite compressors. You can use a stock compressor if you want to. The ones that come with your DAW, you can use third-party compressors. There's some great ones out there. You can use hardware compressors. It really doesn't matter. It's completely up to you. Each compressor will respond differently, will have possibly different parameter controls, and may even add some analog elements to your mix as well, meaning some of the plugins, the third-party plugins, emulate the hardware, the analog sound that that you get when passing audio through a vintage piece of hardware, you know, a vintage compressor. All of those things will affect the overall sound of this parallel compressed drum channel. In that sense, it is important to think about what compressor you want to use, but as far as the concept of parallel compression, any compressor will work as long as you understand the concepts of parallel compression. So. We have our stock compressor from Studio One. Very fast attack, fairly fast release, pretty aggressive ratio and threshold settings. So we're getting a lot of compression in our parallel drum bus. Now what I want to do is open up four other compressors. These are compressors that I really like and use. And I've set similar settings. I want you to hear how different those settings sound with different compressors. Okay, so the first one is Alloy. Let me first disable the stock compressor within uh, Studio One. So this is Alloy 2. And again, very similar settings. I won't go through them. I just kind of match the settings. But let's take a listen to how that sounds with the drum track that we have. To me, a little less sustain than the stock compressor. Of course, we can go in and tweak that, but I just want to show you very quickly a few different compressors. Here's another one of my favorites, Slate Digital. This is an emulation of kind of the classic SSL console, the big mixing desks that you would see in big studios. This is the bus compressor, the SSL bus compressor. You basically run everything through this and it's made for bus, multiple tracks, compressing multiple tracks. Fast attack, relatively fast release. Again, a pretty aggressive threshold and ratio. Let me get that up to about eight or nine. Same thing that we're doing here. Again, I can push this a lot harder, it seems, and it's a little bit more transparent. So this compressor reacts a bit differently, and this is going to add a little bit of that analog sound to your mix as well. This is another one, more of a channel compressor that you would see in a lot of mixing consoles. Uh, 
On this one, you do have a little bit more sustain. I really like how the tom sound, how the kick sounds on this. And finally, this is from Waves. It's a hybrid comp. So I like this because you have some additional settings that you don't have anywhere else. But even when I set the same settings, pretty high ratio, very fast attack, and we have a high threshold, listen to what happens. Uh, there's some analog emulation going on in here as well. But let's take a listen to what it does to our drum bus, our parallel drum bus. like this because you get some of that distortion that you're not hearing in some of the others. So each one of these brings a little bit something different to the table. So what we can do is go in each one. I'll just enable them while we listen to the full mix. I'm going to turn this up a bit more exaggerated just so we can hear what that does. So depending on what compressor you use, you're going to get some different characteristics. It'll react differently. I would suggest using a compressor that you really enjoy. It's better to use one that you know how to adjust it. You know how it will react to source material. As you get to know compressors, you're going to use different compressors for different things. But the compressor really does make a difference. But ultimately, you can use any compressor you want to use this parallel compression technique. Next, let's talk about this transient shaper. And to help me, I've gone back to our drums. Let's take a listen to them real fast in bypass mode. And then I just pulled up a preset called Emphasize Drums. And this transient shaper has helped me emphasize, or if I want to, I can de-emphasize the attack or release. Just like the exciter and the compressor, we have some modes at the top. We can learn and reset the transient shaper as far as their crossover points. And then we have three different bands at the bottom. Let's talk about our envelope modes up here at the top. And these are global, just like the other modules. These affect all three bands, everything within this transient shaper module. Precise is the fastest recovery time. It's most accurate and responsive when adding or removing attack. Now I'm gonna jump all the way over to loose, and this is the slowest transit recovery time. This is best for adding sustain. Now right in between we have balanced, and this is the best of both worlds, right in between. You can of course hit learn and automatically find the best crossover frequencies. This is just a suggestion again, feel free to move these however you want and reset them if you want. And then we have our gain adjustment over time right here in the middle. We can see what's happening to that signal as far as gain being added or attenuation. See the middle frequencies, the middle band, and then the low frequencies are low band. So all three are doing something very, very different. We have increased sustain in two of them, and then decreased sustain in the last one. Our attacks are doing something different. Now, just like with most transient shapers on the market, 
It's a very simple interface. You either add attack or remove attack, add sustain or remove sustain. And then we have three different options in the middle for contour. Sharp is fast and tight, best on drums. We have medium, which is transparent, good on lots of stuff. Then we have smooth, which is the slowest envelope, and it allows more of the initial transient through, and it's great for sustained signals. Let's just do some uh, messing around with this. Add some punch to the kick. Reduce some of the sustain, make it go away faster. Maybe make that snare, that bottom snare sound stay around a little bit longer. Let's check out the high frequencies. Add some snap. Probably don't want sustain. There's no harm in checking it out. Of course, we can bypass these, see what each band is doing. And then change the mix. Blend in the dry with the wet. And we can A, B, let's bypass it. And of course, make sure you listen to it in the mix. After this, Let's talk about the limiter section. I'll see you then. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another video. In this demonstration, I'm gonna show you how you can treat a two track recording, especially in hip hop music, and how to actually do some processing to it. The problem with mixtapes and two track recordings is that most of the time these are MP3 downloads. And with that, you already have the MP3 compression, you have uh, aliasing happening on the sides, and it's just a real big problem. You have no separation, you have no access to the kick, snare, hi-hat, or instruments. But there are some techniques that you can use to help improve what's already there. So I'm going to play this track first. This is a track by Kofi. It's called Two Miles an Hour. Check it out. Okay, so the thing that we want to focus is on the music. And if I jump into the mixer, you're going to see that the track is right here on the left. So let's go ahead and just play that from where the beat begins. And the overall mix balance is okay. I mean, we can improve that. And what I'm going to do first is just apply a little bit of EQ. Now, if you have a mid side EQ, that's great because then you can EQ the mid or what's in the center versus what's on the sides or what's on the stereo. And for this, I'm going to use an EQ by Brainworks. It's called BX Digital V2. And the thing that I want to listen for here on the original song is anything that I want to remove or any areas that I want to fix or address. So let's play it back one more time. So the first thing that I want to address is the very sub lows. And by using the auto listen function, I can sweep the frequencies. And I can hear a bump and an impact around 45. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this at 45 and bring this down about a dB and a half. So it's just a low shelf slightly subtracting everything below 45 so it doesn't get in the way of compressors or limiters. Okay, so let's apply the same method. We're going to sweep these frequencies and we're going to find any areas that are um, muddy or that are there's too many instruments living in that space. 
Let's check it out. So around here, I hear a resonant note. It's almost like it's on. It's almost like a drone note that's just on the whole time. So let's take this out of auto listen. Let's boost that up and see if we can better define it. Okay, right there. And let's go ahead and bring this down to, uh, let's try 3 dB first. So let's compare, bypass this, and we'll bring it on. So what I can hear right away is that the bottom opens up a little bit more. There's a little bit more depth and definition. But let's increase this just a little bit to around minus 2. Okay. Now, with this plugin, you can actually solo the sides and hear all the uh, stereo information. So let's check that out. And if you hear like a facing effect, that's exactly what I'm talking about, MP3s. Um, they have this problem on the sides that it already gets compressed, so it's very, very hard to deal with. So really, the only thing that we can do here is just remove things that are uh, too loud or too uh, resonant. Yeah, that's very resonant, very obvious. So let's bring that down. And let's also remove the lows from the side. And what I listen for is I listen for the lowest bass note or the fundamental or the key of the song. And that seems to be around 120, 130. So uh, instead of filtering out, we'll just use the low shelf. And let's bring this down about 3 dB or so. And now let's listen to the before and after. So we lose a little bit of volume, that's because we are reducing those frequencies, but overall it sounds a little bit more pleasing. So if we throw this into a compressor, that compressor is going to better behave than if we just leave those low muddy frequencies living down there. Now an additional step that I would use for EQ is use a different instance of EQ. So let's go ahead and just bring up our classic Pro Tools EQ here. And one of the things about MP3s is that it usually cuts everything above 16K. So sometimes it's not a bad idea to do that in the mix because that's going to happen anyways when you convert it to MP3. So it's optional. Uh, you definitely don't have to do it, but you know, it's something that might help you along the way. So let's just see what happens. Let's go ahead and enable this filter. Type it in 16K. Let's listen to the track uh, without both EQs and then with both EQs. Okay, great. Now when you start adding the vocals and the vocal doubles and the chorus and all the hooks and all that stuff, you have a little bit more space to play with because we cleaned up that information from the music. Hope you enjoyed. Marinate on all that good stuff, put it to use, and you'll see your stuff grow. Next week, brand new mix contest, part one of an incredible, incredible gear expo. Great to see you. Thanks for hanging with us and we'll see you next week.